I always have mixed emotions about the end of an event. I always enjoy visiting with folks and being with them, but I've been kind of on a run this month. This will be, when we finish lunch today, this will be the 20th time I've spoken since Thursday. And so uh, I'm going to use your microphone and save a little bit of my voice. And then if it doesn't rain in Alabama tomorrow, I'll have the day off and I'll go hunting. But uh, I think it's going to rain and I may hunt anyway. But if you want to look at the book of Ephesians, we'll... Uh, I like to, to, to do studies with adults, especially when you look at a book. And so many times as a preacher, you end up having a short amount of time, and so you get a short piece of scripture, and you camp out on it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I think it, it tends to be what you would call a micro-analysis. And I like to encourage folks to, to read and study their Bible and get a handle on a big concept and when you understand the big concept, you can start breaking down the, the minor concepts. So I'd kind of like to do an overview of Ephesians, and there's several different ways you can overview it. Um, but if you'll start in chapter 1 and just kind of glance through as you read it, look at what I would call intentional language. You'll see the word purpose. You'll see the word pleasure. You'll see the word according to the pleasure of his will. You'll see that he predetermined. Some of the translations will have predestined. Uh, when, anytime you run into predestined in the New Testament, think about the term predetermined. Predetermined means antecedent conditions. If this, then this, then this. It's not that I'm taking away free will. It's not that God's making people do things. But God said, I'll send my son. He'll be crucified and resurrected. Anybody that believes in him will be chosen as one of my children. It's predetermination more than predestination like we kind of have gone used to the word being used. So if you look through Ephesians chapter 1, you get God chose. God according to the pleasure, according to the purpose which he purposed, according to his good pleasure, according to his will. So the book of Ephesians it starts out with Paul saying, hey, God's got a plan. God has had an intent toward humanity, and you'll even find out prior to the foundation of the world. Before God ever said, let there be light, God had this plan in his mind for what he was going to do with people. Now, without, you know, spoiler alert, the cross is the plus sign of the universe. It's going to add God and people together. It's going to add people and people together. And that's what the book of Ephesians is going to talk about, God bringing together humanity and humanity. So when you finally get to the what we call in the English Bible, the end of chapter 1, notice what he says, verse 22 of chapter 1. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. One translation said, who feels everything in every way. Now, what does, what does that mean? What does it mean to feel all in all or to fulfill everything in every way? What does that mean? You ever filled a milk jug up with water and froze it? Then cut it out? What, what does that block of ice look like? Like a milk jug. It filled everything... In every way. Did that little handle, and I always thought that was really cool. You know, it, it, it filled every nook and cranny, as we say. Everything that God ever intended to do with people is going to be accomplished through Christ. Not only is it going to be accomplished through Christ, it's going to be accomplished through Christ and the church becoming the body of Christ. So this thing, this intent, this plan that God has for humanity can only be accomplished in the church. There's no other agenda. There's nothing that's going. You want to talk about priorities? And Derek, when he emailed me and asked me to speak here, uh, said, you know, talk about some commitment. Well, if the church is not one of your main commitments, then you are derailing what God's intent is for us as, as, as living. Because God says, I've got this thing I'm going to do. It's been my purpose. It's been my pleasure. It's been my will. It's, it, it's according to the determinant counsel. I've done all these things, and it's going to be fulfilled. It's going to be filled full in this thing that we call the body. And then he talks about God's mercy. He talks about God's grace. And, and if you want to look at uh, verse 11 of chapter 2, he really is going to kind of 
to explain what God was doing. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, two dividing lines, Gentiles versus Jews, circumcised versus uncircumcised. At that time, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the before picture. You've seen those magazine ads before versus after. All right, this is the before. Before you get to this manifestation of God's plan, you weren't connected to Israel. You weren't part of the commonwealth. You were strangers from the covenant. You were without God. You were without Christ. And you didn't have any hope in the world. Look at verse 13. But now, in Christ, you who were once before have now been brought near after by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one has broken down the middle wall of separation as abolishing his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace. He said what God intended to do, and, and even when he separated Abraham out and created what we call the Jewish nation, it was never intended that it would only be Abraham and the Jews forever. God separated Abraham to bring the Messiah to reunite all humanity. He said, so you at one time were separated, you were without God, you were without hope, you were without Christ, and now he's made two groups of people one new man. He's made one out of two. Just like he talked about in marriage, the two become one. We talk about this with people. There's not going to be an identity anymore that has to do with Jew or Gentile or slave or free or barbarian or Scythian or anything else. He, he made people and people came together. Verse 16, and he might reconcile them both, the Jews and the Gentiles, are going to be reconciled to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he has come and preached peace to those who are far off and those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So Paul says this is what God was intending to do. And in this thing that we call the church, this thing we call the body of Christ, it accomplishes these two goals. It takes these two different nations, it takes these two different people, and it puts people and people together, and then it gives both those groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, access through the cross, access through the blood of Christ, access through, gives them connection to God. And then Paul's going to say in chapter 3 that this has been what he calls the mystery. Because in the Old Testament, they really didn't know what God was doing. The Jews didn't get it. In fact, the Jews were resistant when the Gentiles got invited to be in the church. Some of the Old Testament prophets would make these prophecies and not really clearly understand what they were talking about. So Paul refers to this as the mystery. Verse 5, In other ages this was not known to the sons of men, but now it has been revealed by the Holy Spirit and His holy apostles to the prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel for which I became a minister. Paul says the, the purpose of this is that the Old Testament prophets and, and, and even some of the angels didn't get the idea that what God was doing in the lives of people were bringing people and people together and then uniting all those people to God. Never was God's intention for there to be only one group of saved people. And so that's, that's the purpose, that's the mystery. Look at verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus... How long has this purpose existed? It's pre-time. It's eternal. It's always existing. So Paul says, here's what happened. God had this intention, knew that man would separate. Man would separate himself from God and man would separate himself from other people. And I'm going to bring Christ into the world and through the advent of his death, burial, resurrection, the creation of the church, I'm going to use the cross and I'm going to unite people and people and God and people. Now he's writing to people who already know this. He's writing to people who've been united. He's writing to people who've been united with God and they've been united with each other. You've got a church in, in Ephesus that is consisting of Jews and Gentiles. 
You've got a group of people in Ephesus who used to be lost, but now they're saved. And so once he gets them on board, this is what you've got to be thinking of. This is your participation in the mystery. If you're a Christian, this is what your job is. He's going to start in chapter 4, and he's going to do about four or five series where he says, if you're participating in this thing, you've got to change the way you live. And the word he uses for living is walk. You've got to walk a certain way. Uh, I, one of my favorite t-shirts, it got tore up in a football game. It was a long sleeve white t-shirt, had footprints on it. And it said, you can talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? Well, I, maybe Paul didn't have a t-shirt like that, but he should have. So he's going to do a, a couple of series of walk passages. For, so to survey the book of Ephesians, we're basically going to say, here's the backdrop. We've got the mystery. The mystery was that God's got to bring God and people together and people and people together. And then if we've been brought together with God and if we've been brought together with other people, this is how we're supposed to live. This is what we're supposed to do. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. Because he's a prisoner, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beg you, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling. Walk number one. If you're going to be part of the mystery, if you're going to be part of this thing that God is doing, our walk has got to be worthy. It's got to be consistent of, of what we claim to be. Uh, I travel. Because I travel, I eat at restaurants. Because I eat at restaurants while I travel, I eat at fast food restaurants. I don't like to go into a restaurant, make my order, and then ask me my name. I'm not trying to adopt you. I, I just want a burger. I'm going to throw the bread away, I'm going to get in the car, and I'm going to go eat, you know. But, but they, they do that. They, 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 I've got a buddy, when they ask him his name, he will look on their name tag and tell them their name. And it doesn't matter who they are. He does it with a straight face. He's standing right there in the room. Uh, can I have a name for the order? Letitia. And I mean, it's just plain and simple. It, 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 it's pretty funny stuff to watch it happen. I got another friend, and he says his name is Jay Sanchez. And, and, and he, he laughs. He, he'll go, Jay Sanchez, he'll go back to his table and laugh. Real dry fellow. So I had to ask him one day. I said, okay, Larry, what's the deal with Jay Sanchez? Larry Shields is a federal marshal. He's part of the uh, Fugitive Task Force, Regional Task Force in North Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee, and they hunt the fugitives. And, and if there's somebody that the FBI is looking for, somebody there, and they get in our area, Larry and his guys go get them. They're walking down the mall, and, and undercover federal agents will wear 5'11 pants, some military-style looking pants. They'll always have a shirt that's not tucked in, and they'll be clean-shaven white dudes. That's a federal marshal. You see three guys walking together in 5'11 pants with an... That's a fed. You can smell them. So they're walking down the mall, and there's this guy standing, and by his body posture, he's giving these three young ladies a hard time. Well, Larry used to play ball for University of South at Swanee, big guy. He eases up to this dude and says, excuse me, sirs, there's a problem. This young man whips a badge out and says, back off, I'm a federal marshal. And Larry and his buddies reach in their pocket and go, that's odd, your badge doesn't look like our badge. <laughs> the dude's name was Jay Sanchez and he pretended to be a federal marshal. He spoke at University of Chattanooga in Tennessee for two hours on career night about being a federal marshal. And he's not a federal marshal. He may be schizophrenic, but he's not a federal marshal. And so Larry uses his name when he goes into restaurants, kind of as payback, I guess. He, Jay Sanchez is not a federal, he's in federal prison now, but he's not a federal marshal. He had a title that he wasn't worthy of. When you show your badge and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a member of the body, does God go, that's funny, doesn't look like mine. Does Jesus say, that's odd, it doesn't look like mine? Paul says, when you claim to be this, your walk has to be worthy of your calling. Now, notice how he describes this walking. Verse 2 of chapter 4. Lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. When you claim to be a Christian, it doesn't make you haughty. It doesn't make you arrogant. Doesn't make you look down on people. You do this in lowliness. When you do have to deal with people who aren't living right, you do it with gentleness. And then when you deal with other people, you have two things. Long suffering, the ability to suffer long. 
and bearing with one another. Now, what does bearing with one another mean? That means people are going to make mistakes. And we need to be able to be mature enough to get past the fact that people make mistakes. I'm an imperfect person. I married an imperfect person. I live in a neighborhood with imperfect people. I go to church with imperfect people. But all of a sudden, somebody acts imperfect. What do we do? We feel like the world's come to an end. If you've got a problem with somebody's imperfections, you know what you're supposed to do as a Christian? Bear with one another. Basically, it says get over it. Now, I know, and, and I'm going to get on a soapbox for just a minute. Lonnie, Matthew chapter 18 says, if you've got something against your brother, you, you're supposed to go to your brother. You read Matthew chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go to your brother and tell him his fault. That's a heaven versus hell issue. If you're doing something that's going to compromise your soul, I need to talk to you about that. But if it has nothing to do with your soul, you got in my parking place, you didn't come to my daughter's baby shower, you didn't give my kid as good a, a graduation present as I gave yours, guess what you're supposed to do with those kind of things? Grow up and get over it. Matthew chapter 18 is not a hunting license. If it's a heaven or hell issue, we confront it. If it doesn't do with somebody's salvation, as mature people who are walking worthy of the calling, we long suffer, we deal with gentleness, we endeavor to keep unity, and we bear with one another. We get past that kind of petty little junk. Second thing that's supposed to happen. Oh, by the way, when he talks about unity, he gives seven markers for unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body... There's one spirit, just as you were called. There's one hope of your calling. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God, one Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. He says, you need to look at what you share in common with people rather than camping out so much on your differences. And if you've got those things in common, that's a good place to start. It's not the, the end all, be all, but it's a good place to start. And if you can establish unity in those areas, you can probably convert somebody out of any kind of error, out of any kind of denominationalism. Now, at any point they decide that there can be more than one body or there's more than one God or there's more than one salvation, ah, you can't do much with that. But if you can establish that as common ground, God and people, people to people. God and people, people to people. Second walk passage. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say therefore and testify of the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, and who being past feeling have given themselves to lewdness and uncleanliness with greediness, but you have not so learned in Christ. The second thing we have to do is we're going to walk. If, you, if I say, hey, I'm a Christian, not only do I have to walk worthy, I've got to walk different. There's got to be a pretty distinct before versus after picture, okay? And if your before picture and your after picture doesn't look a lot different, i got to question what happened. Paul says, you've got to remember, you can no longer identify with this group of people that you left. You've got to walk different from the Gentiles. You can't participate in the lewdness. You can't participate in the uncleanness. In fact, notice what he says in verse 20. You have not so learned in Christ. And if you've been taught by Christ, as the truth is in Jesus, that you must put off according to your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You can't act the way you used to act with people. Now, he talks about the lust we superimpose when we talk about lust, it's always sexual. That's not always true. A lust is, if you think about it, it's a desire that's using steroids. It's a desire that has gotten big and strong and raging and out of control. doesn't always have to do with, with, with uh, sexual immorality. In fact, as you keep reading this, notice what he says in 25 all the way to the end of the chapter. Put away lying. Speak truth to your neighbor. Be angry and don't sin. Let the person who stole quit stealing and, and do something different than that. Uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking with malice. 
and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. When he says you're walking different than the Gentiles, he really doesn't make a strong case for don't be immoral. He makes a strong case for change how you treat people. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cut, no. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. The morality teaching of the New Testament will come later. But right now, he's telling them, if you're going to walk worthy and you're going to walk different, you really got to change the way you interact with other people. And how many times have you heard somebody claim to be a Christian but saw the way they treated people and you couldn't hear what they were saying for listening to what they were doing? Walk worthy, walk different. Chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice that was sweet-smelling fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for those neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather the giving of thanks and know this no fornicator that's sexually immoral no fornicator, unclean person nor covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the, in the kingdom of God when he says walk worthy that's in unity that's in us getting along and how we treat people. When he says walk different than the Gentiles, he really expounds on being different than other people. And then when he says walk in love, that's when he covers morality. If I love you, I won't sin with you and I won't sin against you. Read Aubrey Johnson's book, Love More, Sin Less. It's a really, really good little work that Aubrey put together. But when Paul talks about walking as, as somebody who's in the kingdom and walking worthy and walking different than the Gentiles, he says when you walk in love, you don't sin with people and you don't sin against people. I, I do unfortunately have to deal with folks who are involved in extramarital affairs. But I love this person more than I do my wife. I said, well, if you love this person, why are you going to enter into a relationship with them? They're going to send you both to hell. The people that I love, I don't want to go to hell. And if you really love this person, then why are you acting in such a way and behaving in such a way that you're going to take both of you down that path? If you love somebody, you won't sin with them. And if you love somebody, you won't sin against them. The, pre, the prohibition to sexual immorality is love, not the other way around. And we often think about that, hey, if you've got to be different than the world. No, no, when, when Paul says your motivation for not doing these unspeakable things that, that he'll say in verse 12 that it's a shame to even talk about, your motivation for that is because you are people of love. Love doesn't sin with its neighbor. Love doesn't sin against its neighbor. So Paul's going to say you've got to walk worthy. You've got to walk different. You've got to walk in love. Then he's going to say you've got to walk in light. Chapter 5, verse 8. You were once in darkness, but now you are the light of, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. I told you last night that the, the expanded version of the fruit of the Spirit was love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. This is the short version. Good, right, and true. You want to ask yourself, am I a child of light? Well, if you're a child of light, then, then what you're going to be involved in will be good, it'll be right, and it'll be true. Now, for, for a fun homework project or something you want to do for your personal Bible study, go home and take those three words, and good, right, and true. And then take the nine things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and see where they fit in those three words, and you'll find a really cool study. Because everything that is good, right, and true can be found Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says, you've got to walk in, in love. You've got to walk in light. You've got to walk different than the Gentiles. And you've got to walk worthy of this calling. And then the last thing he's going to talk about when he talks about walking, he's going to talk about walking wisely. So go down to verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. Now I'll have to confess, I don't know what circumspectly means. But in context, you can tell. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise. 
Circumspectly means we're going to be wise walkers. How does a person walk in wisdom? Number one, you redeem the, the time because the days are evil. Folks, we waste a lot of time in things that aren't important. We spend an awful lot of time on what I call spinning our wheels uh, <laughs> in training police cadets. We call it dynamic inactivity. Yeah, and dynamic inactivity. If, if these two pews represent a doorway, a young police cadet or especially a basic tactical operator and you go stand at that door and you give this other guy signals, you do a crossing pattern on three, you first, one, two, three, and you go through the door. Everybody walks through a door, right? That's how you walk through a door. You take a young police cadet and you say, now you're going to walk through that door, but here's a pistol. All of a sudden, he loses his mind. <laughs> and he looks like he's on a bad episode of Charlie's Angels. You walk through a door with a pistol the same way you walk through a door without a pistol. It's like walking, only walking. But you put a pistol in their hand and they lose, they go crazy. They jump around like Batman and Robin. It just walk through the door. We call it dynamic inactivity. How many times have you seen the church involved in dynamic inactivity? We're going to do a program. We're going to do a, 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 a visitation program. What happened to folks in the church who love each other enough to visit each other? If it's got to be organized and I've got to assign you somebody to care about, ooh. That's like somebody asking, how many times do I have to kiss my wife? Well, if you're counting, <laughs> I don't want you kissing on me anyway. <laughs> you know, the way that goes. But we're going to redeem the time. In the story of Mary and Martha, Martha thinks she's serving the Lord. But her description is she's worried and troubled and distracted. And her serving the Lord makes her frustrated with Mary and makes her a little bit mad at the Lord. If what we're doing frustrates us, I think it's dynamic inactivity and we're not walking wise and we're not redeeming the time. Here's a, here's a better way to redeem the time. Verse 17, Therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. When you get up in the morning, on your agenda should be, what is God's will for me today? What, what is God wanting me to do at school, at work, at home, at the ball field, at Walmart, in traffic, wherever? And if we can put on the forefront of our mind that today's not about my agenda, today is about God's agenda. Um, I heard a guy give a really interesting thing. He said he was down near Atlanta and he got to be an extra in one of those zombie movies. And they were just called, they just did an all call. If you want to come, you know, spend half a day in hot makeup and wander around the woods, you'd be a zombie. And so he's, he said, man, I got, I went down and got my makeup on. And he said, I was in a, I think he said a 3.2 second clip of the movie as a zombie. Well, he rented the theater out invited all his friends to come see his movie. <laughs> now, how many times do we act like it's our movie? Folks, I'm a 3.2 second extra in a movie that's about Christ. I'm an extra. It's not my movie. I'm not the star. i got to figure out what's my role for the 3.2 seconds I'm on this planet. And am I doing what I'm supposed to? What is the will of the Lord? What is the, the part he has assigned to me? And if I start my day with what is God's will in my life, I'll probably be efficient and effective and I'll be redeeming the time and, and I'll be wise. Now, he's going to expound on what it is to walk wisely. He'll, he'll keep going. This is our last walk section. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't be drunk with wine. One version says, don't be filled with wine, which leads to dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. He says, look, if you really want to know how to be a wise walker, if you want to know how to fill your time up, hey, don't fill your life up with wine. When you fill your life up with wine, you get an overflow of dissipation. If you fill your life up with substances, what you get is out-of-control behavior. 
in juxtaposition or in contrast to that, he says, fill your life with the Spirit. Now, what happens when a person's life is full of the Spirit? It overflows in Psalms. It overflows in Thanksgiving. It overflows in praise. He says, don't be a person who's out here filling your life up with negativity. Don't fill your life up with debauchery. Don't fill your life up with out-of-control behavior. Fill your life up with the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. And when your life is full of that, what comes out naturally? Praise, thanksgiving to God. People who are sour and unthankful aren't spiritual people. And people who are spiritual are thankful and praiseworthy. And he, he continues, and submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. In the same way that the dynamic is God and people and people and people, it's actually a triangle. That if I'm over here and you're over here, the strength of our relationship really is dependent on the strength of my relationship with God. And the closer we get to God, the closer we get to one another. That's a true relationship. And Paul says, if you're going to manage your relationships, when you start talking about how I get along with a person who used to be a Gentile, who used to be a Jew, who used to be Greek, who used to be barbarian or Scythian, he said, when you start asking how do these different kinds of people get along, he says, you get along because you use a Christ filter. When you look at people through the Christ filter, it changes the way you interpret them. I don't get to treat you based on who you are. I get to treat you based on who Christ is. And if I see you through the Christ filter, I see you in a different, because I've got to walk worthy. i got to walk different. i got to walk in love. i got to walk in light. i got to walk wisely. And notice the, the dynamics. He'll talk about wives and husbands. He'll talk about husbands and wives. Chapter 6, he'll talk about children and parents. He'll talk about parents and children. He'll talk about slaves and masters. He'll talk about masters and slaves. And so as he begins to say, if you're going to be a, a person who walks worthy and a person who walks as light and a person who walks as love and a person who walks different than you used to walk and you're going to be a person of wisdom, your conduct, your interaction on a daily basis has to be different and it has to be based on your connection to Christ. I treat my wife the way I treat my wife, not because of who my wife is, but because of who my Lord is. And I treat my boss the way I treat my boss, not because of who my boss is, but because of who my Lord is. And if I happen to be the boss, I treat my employees not, not based on what they do, but based on who my boss is. Notice what he says about Servants and masters, verse 5 of chapter 6. Bond servants, slaves, be obedient to your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service, not as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Listen, when you go to work, and you go to school, and you encounter anybody who has authority in your life, you're supposed to respond to that authority the same way you respond to Jesus. I saw a bumper sticker on a car one time that said, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. I thought that was pretty good. When I go to work, I'm not going to work for me, I'm not going to work for Avco, I'm not going to work for this, I'm going to work for Christ. That's how you redeem the time. That's how you understand what the will of the Lord is. That's how you do this dynamic that I'm submitting to one another out of my reverence for Christ. Uh, in Henry Cloud and John Townsend's book, Boundaries, they'll go as far as to say, if you've got a submission problem, when you're nine times out of ten, it's because the person that is arguing, he's not submissive, submissive because they're not leading in a that is selfless in Christ. You notice that if you read Ephesians 5, 22 through the end of the chapter, you'll, you'll come up with this dynamic that the church was submissive to Christ because Christ was submissive to the needs of the church. And husbands, if we really want to be the leaders in our home like we're supposed to be, Christ was submissive to the needs of the church. Not... Christ came in, sat down in the easy chair and yelled to the church, Church, bring me some tea. 
He served the church. He wasn't a Lord and Master. That's a different dynamic. That's a wrong thing that we've taught. Christ, the church submitted to Christ because Christ was looking out for the good of the church. That selflessness dynamic we've talked about all weekend, the more selfishness you have, the less trust you have. The least selfishness you have, the more trust you have. And the church was able to trust and submit to Christ because everything he did was for her. And so you look at the book of Ephesians, and, and the book of Ephesians simply says, hey, God's got this plan for people to get along and for people to get along with God. And in order to do that, you've got different categories of walking. You've got to walk worthy. You've got to walk different. You've got to walk in love. You've got to walk in light. And you've got to walk wisely. Now, the cool thing that he does right at the end of the chapter is he changes from walking to standing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Skip down to verse 14. Stand, therefore, having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all taking on the shield of faith which is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, praying always in all prayer and all supplication in the spirit. Paul gives this outline of this, this, this armor and it's interesting that we add to that armor. As, as a guy who works with cops, I add a radio to the armor because he talks about prayer. When you look at this armor, I want, you to, I want you to understand the context of this. He's talked about walk, 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 walk. Now he says stand. This is not about warfare. This is about survival. Think about going snorkeling in Alaska. I got, I got to, yeah, if you laugh, my wife talked me into that business. In order to snorkel in Alaska, you've got to put on a special suit that keeps you warm. You've got to wear a special suit that helps you float. You've got to wear a mask that you can see in salt water. You've got to have a tube in your mouth you can breathe. I'm a land walker, an air breather, and got a 98.6 degree body temperature, and I had to put on a special outfit to survive in a hostile environment. When a spiritual person walks in a physical world, he's got to have something special. Truth, righteousness, salvation, peace, faith, and the word of God. This is not about us going out here and declaring war on people. Because what's the purpose of the gospel? People and people and God and people. Now the bell's going to get me, but please be patient with me. The LGBTQ movement is not your enemy. The abortion crowd is not your enemy. The transgender bunch is not your enemy. The atheistic professor over here at the university is not your enemy. The humanistic psychologist is not your enemy. Those folks are victims of your enemy. When you put on the helmet and the sword and the shield, you're not going to war with people. Listen to what he says about our warfare. Verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You ain't at war with anybody. You do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God. You're wearing this armor as a survival suit. What does a spiritual person have to have to survive in this physical world against the devil? And see, the devil's already got those folks. And if he can get me to hate them, and declare war on them, he's got me too. Our battle is not against people. Our battle is against the devil. And in order to survive as a spiritual person in a, phys in a hostile environment, i got to have truth, righteousness, salvation, peace, faith, the word of God, and i got to talk to headquarters every now and then. But it's not about, we, we get this imagery of the sword and the shield and we want to go to war. It's not about fighting people. It's about surviving its spiritual wickedness. And if we ever change our focus and we're at war with people, a Facebook post has never changed anybody's opinion. Quit being a keyboard warrior. Get involved in somebody's life and do something that involves truth, 
righteousness, salvation, peace, faith, and the Word of God. And then you make a difference. God and people, people and people. Walk, 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 walk. And then when that's done, you have these things to help you stand. How to survive as a spiritual creature in a physical world. That's kind of a survey of Ephesians. I appreciate you studying with me this morning. Thank you.